next presenter is Anna Quellman. Uh, will be hi. A demo. Yeah. Yeah. demo of tools for ROS2 and flight software interoper interoperability. All right, it's all yours, uh, Anna. Uh, hi, everybody. Can you guys hear me fine? Yes, we can hear you. Wonderful. Okay. Uh, again, uh, hi, everybody. Thank you so much for uh, listening to this talk today. The title, uh, as Steven said, is Tools for ROS2 and Flight Software Interoperability. Uh, this project has been funded under a couple of NASA STTR contracts, and it's actually ending uh, in, a bit, in a couple of months. Uh, my name is Anna Waman. I'm the PI for this project. Uh, I'm with Track Labs in Houston, and all the work that I'm going to present to you guys uh, has been done uh, mainly, to be honest, for my awesome colleagues, Todd Milan from Track Labs, and our wonderful collaborator from APL, Andrew Harris and David Edel. A brief overview of what I'm going to talk about. First, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about the motivation behind this work. Second, I'm going to show you some videos of demonstrations. If I have time at the end, I'm going to run some things on my computer. And then I'm going to briefly give you a high-level overview of the tools we have developed. And at the end, uh, my favorite part, uh, I'm going to point you to some tutorials and documentations. So in case I don't have time for these demonstrations, I'm going to give you all the tools for you to run it on your very own machines. So you don't need me for that. Uh, let's start with the motivation for this work. Uh, the title of this uh, talk is Tools for ROS2 and Flight Software Interoperability. Uh, now, a bit of background. Uh, my background is robotics, so I'm more familiar with ROS2. So let me start by telling you why you should care about using these two uh, frameworks together. Uh, first, ROS2. Uh, so during the last, I would say, 10 or 15 years, there has been a strong push in the robotics community to develop common software tools for enabling advanced robotic applications. In a few words, uh, we want to we don't want to reinvent the wheel. If somebody want to come and let's say program a rover to run around, you don't want the developers to start from scratch. Ideally, you want to be able to use to reuse libraries that previous missions or previous people in the community have used. So this is an oversimplification, but ROS allows you to do that. ROS is a, a software framework that provides you a lot of tools that are ready to use. Those tools include visualization, motion planning, tools for computer vision, uh, for communication at a low level, simulation, physics simulation, uh, kinematic simulation, and so on. Here you have a small picture of uh, some uh, ROS visualization tools. Uh, so if you know anybody who works in robotics, chances are that they have either used ROS, they are using ROS, or at least they know about ROS. So it's a pretty big uh, component in the robotics software community. Initially, this work has had been done, oh, it's open source. Initially, it started as most of a res researchy uh, set of tools, but as people have realized how useful it is to have tools that can be reused, uh, there has been there have been user cases in the industry, and also in some NASA labs, uh, you can see that some robots at an experimental stage at this point are also using ROS, such as uh, Astro V and uh, Robonaut, to mention a couple. Now that is on the side of robotics. In the side of flight software, well, I'm in the flight software workshop, so I guess I don't need to give much background. But let's just say that a similar effort. Uh, on developing common uh, frameworks and tools that can be shared and reused has been going on for the last uh, for, for the last years. Some of these frameworks, as you guys know, CFS and F prime, uh, they aim again not to reinvent the wheel every time. And we know that tools like CFS have been used and, and F prime have been used uh, in missions. So we know that they are useful. They, we know they are successful. So we want to keep using them as uh, as much as possible. So again, we have ROS2, we have CFS, we know they are great, and we want to integrate them together. So the goal of our work has been to investigate ways to integrate the NASA flight software system with ROS2 in order to leverage the advantages and strengths of each of them for robotic spaceflight applications. 
So that was the motivation for this work. Uh, the title of this project is BRASH, and it stands for Bridge for ROS2 Application uh, to Space Hardware. So uh, last year, one of my colleagues already gave a talk on this. I'm going to give you an updated talk with some of the things we have developed during this last year. And I'll start, instead of the technical stuff, by doing the demonstrations, hopefully to, get, to convince you that doing this work of integrating these tools is actually useful. And maybe you can use it on your own work. So uh, let me start with this. So in this example, uh, we have uh, how to operate a Canada arm. The left side uh, with a pink uh, with a pink background. Imagine that's your ground side, running on one machine, and the uh, right side. Imagine that that is a remote location. Maybe that's the gateway or the ISS, and you have a robot arm that is uh, outside. And in the spacecraft, you have CFS, and on the ground, let's say you have an operator who want to use ROS2 to operate the robot. Now, ROS2 has its own way to communicate and to send. Uh, information. CFS, we also know it has its own way. So a bridge uh, would be needed to be able to connect these two sites. So if you want to send commands from the ROS2 framework, you can do so. The bridge would uh, transform this information uh, for CFS. And when you get telemetry back from CFS, this, the bridge would transform the information uh, into a ROS2 message. Now, uh, just, uh, just to be clear in case Maybe in case of some of you are not quite familiar with ROS. So this visualization tool, these commands here, uh, I add a few buttons for moving the arm in different locations. I didn't, other than these buttons, all these tools were already ready in ROS2. So that's an advantage of using it. There are already a lot of tools that you can just use with any robot. So uh, for instance, like here you can see that the arm is moving really slow. Uh, and, but very smoothly. At the left, uh, you can see the data on the ground. It's a bit hard to say, but the robot is moving a bit choppy. Uh, that is because the telemetry data is coming back at one hertz. So you're getting it a bit slow. Now, other advantage of using uh, this bridge that we propose is that you can use ROS2 if you want. I mean, that's, a, that's our main purpose. But you can all, this bridge also open the door to use tools that talk with ROS2. So you can, so for instance, like here, uh, at the lower left, you can see, sorry, that's a bit small, but that is an open MCT window. And here I'm, visual, I'm visualizing the joint values for the robot arm. So uh, I didn't have to do anything special for this. Since I have this bridge, uh, the open MCT, we have a ROS plugin for it. So we can automatically see the telemetry data with nothing else done uh, to do this. Uh, well, the video goes on, uh, so I'm going to just stop that one there. Let me see uh, a second example, similar to the one before. To the left side, we have the ground side in a machine. The second, the, at the right side, we have, imagine that you're in Mars and that's a simulation. That's also a ROS2 tool called Gazebo. And we have uh, Curiosity, a rover going around. Similar to the example before, uh, here we have uh, user interfaces tools in ROS2. The tool on top uh, is, a, is something called RQT, and you can send uh, velocity commands to the robot. Again, you have the bridge to do this transformation from ROS2 to CFS. And the robot sends back telemetry data, such as the robot pose. So you can see here, uh, let me move the video a little bit. These red lines, uh, in the lower left uh, window, that is the telemetry data of the robot post that you get back with the bridge. Now, ideally, when you are operating a robot, you don't only want to, uh, you know, send commands and get telemetry data back. You may also want to transfer files, and for that, we also use CFDP for that. We created some tools to make to make it easy to use uh, with ROS2 tools. And if you see here uh, in the video. Here, there is a small window that is showing some images that we are getting back from the flight site, uh, simulated flight site using CFDP. Okay, uh, so now those two examples I've shown you, uh, I've mentioned the ground site and the flight site. So we are simulating this using Docker containers. So each of those guys are a separate container. They are under the same network. And those are running on my very beefy uh, work machine. Now. As, as we know, uh, sorry, oh, let me go to the next one. Uh, in 
I did, at some point, uh, missions don't run in very beefy machines, they run in kind of limited hardware. So this was just a simple uh, proof of concept that I was planning to show you, so I couldn't, I couldn't be there, I got sick. But this is a little, again, this is at the left, you have the ground side that is running on my laptop, which you can see here at the lower corner of the video. Something cool, I'm using exactly the same uh, setup that I use for the rover. I just changed uh, the robot. In the video, you can see I have here a little Raspberry Pi that I use that I used to simulate a base far away. And the bridge is talking with the CFS. And CFS is talking itself with the little car. I'll explain a bit later how, also using a bridge. And you can see here how, you know, I'm just using the ground side ROS2 tools to operate a car and also to get images back uh, to the ground site using CFDP. And at the top uh, right, there's a little image of my little car, only 30 bucks, not counting the Raspberry Pi cost. So pretty, pretty simple setup, but I think it's a nice example of showing how our stuff can work on different types of uh, configurations. Now, uh, let me check my time. Okay. So let me give you a it's a high level description of tools. If you want more details, I would be more than happy to talk about this talk. And also heads up, I'm more of a robotics person. So I've learned uh, flight system stuff for this uh, project. But if you have more deep questions, I'll be happy to refer to you to my collaborator from APL for, for those. Okay, so let me describe the general architecture of this uh, bridge. So like I mentioned, we normally have two sites, the flight software site, the ground site. Initially, our main goal was to create uh, a bridge on the ground site. You can see that here at the right. And the purpose of this goal, of this, uh, sorry, of this bridge is to talk with the flight system, let's say CFS, and to get the data from it, the telemetry and commands, and com convert it uh, to a, to a uh, to ROS2 messages that can be uh, passed to the ROS2 components on the ground side that allow a user to, you know, do nice stuff with it. And these ROS2 components, ideally, like I mentioned, you can use, you can reuse any uh, any software available on the ground to, to command your robot. Now, uh, like I mentioned earlier, you can use the ROS2 tools to command the robot and to get tel and to visualize the telemetry, but you don't really have to. Uh, you can use any tool that already talks with ROS2, and there are quite a few of them uh, using our bridge. So our bridge allows you to talk with ROS2 and with any derived uh, tools. An example of one of the tools we are uh, going to use for our final demonstrations in a couple of coming months is a tool called Pride that is an electronic procedure software that we have. Uh, one final thing on the flight software side, uh, I mentioned CFS. Um, most of our demonstrations use CFS for this bridge, but, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, we know that there are other tools out there like F Prime, and we actually also have an example uh, of the bridge using uh, F Prime. But just saying, it can be any flight software really. We have mostly used CFS, but again, it doesn't have to be. And while doing the demonstration, we noticed something interesting. Uh, like, al like I also mentioned earlier, uh, there are quite a bit of robots, especially the robots that are commercially available, that already by default, when you buy one, they come with a ROS2 interface, ROS or ROS2 interface. So ideally, maybe not now, but, it's, but at some point in the future, it's not out of uh, the imagination to think that in a space, you may, we may use some commercial robots. So while you could create, you know, uh, let's say a CFS interface to control them, it's also possible that uh, we could use just robots off the shelf. So we also need a bridge here to be able to talk, you know, between the flight software and the robots as well. Again, you don't have to, but it's also a, a possible, uh, another possible applic application for the bridge. So, okay, let's see, okay. Uh, a bit of on the design, I, I, I won't go much into details. We evaluated a number of possible ways to implement the bridge on the ground first. Uh, we uh, decided to implement the bridge as a ROS2 node. That's just an executable that runs uh, using ROS2 code. And what this bridge does is it uses existing CFS apps such as the telemetry output lab and the command ingest lab. And we use this to get, you know, to send the commands and to get uh, the telemetry data back. 
of course, these uh, UDP packets, they need to be converted to a, a, to a format that ROS2 understands. So we have to also to implement message conversion uh, tools to transfer information back and forth. So again, I, uh, just to give an idea, the purpose of these tools is you have that uh, CFE messages defined as all of you know in C, in C structures, and we need to convert them to uh, ROS2 messages that are defined with uh, a simple YAML file format. So to do this, uh, we use an open source library called UISER from, some, from a lab, Windhover Labs here in Houston. What this library does is uh, it gets as an input an executable or an SO file for instance, like, C like the CFS uh, executable, it goes through all the headers and it gets all the information of the C structures on it. And you have the output is set uh, database with all that information. So we use that information and we create some tools to use that database and generate the ROS2 uh, messages automatically. So that doesn't need the user to, to do anything else. So while we do that, we also created a few a few tools to, uh, you know, for better introspection, to check the messages that are converted, to check what kind of information they have contained. And also a user can add some documentation if he or she wants to do that for future users. Uh, now, I mentioned that we use user for message uh, conversion. You don't have to. For instance, like if you find or if you develop a different uh, library to do message conversion, between CFE and something else, you can do so. So we also, we want the, the bridge to be flexible. So we want to be able to plug in different uh, tools or to give you the ability of creating your own tools using our framework as a baseline. So the message conversion tools are implemented as plugin wrappers. So you can, so you can change that. Uh, you can use any tool you want for that. So we want to be flexible, but uh, like I mentioned, uh, most of our, our examples use CFS, but it doesn't have to be. For instance, what if you want to use uh, F prime? Uh, so our our framework also is built using a plugin-based uh, implementation, which means that you can also write a bridge version of, you know, uh, communicating with F prime. And we have the, and we have uh, such an example. I'm not going to present it here for lack of time, but. Uh, we have done that as a proof of concept, and we have seen that uh, that uh, works. Now, my final uh, example on the bridge sites, like I mentioned a bit earlier, uh, I've talked until now more about the bridge on the ground side. But like I mentioned, uh, it's possible that at some point you may have robots that are running ROS2 on the flight side. Actually, all the robots that I show you I shown you earlier uh, in the demonstrations, all of them already by default came with ROS2. So it was just easier to, to use them like that. So, that. so in order to talk with those robots, the easiest way was to create a bridge that allow us on the flight side to communicate between the flight software and the ROS2 components. And for that, uh, I won't bore you with the details, but we chose to use SVN uh, to do this uh, bridge and what we do is well as we know SVN is a way to connect in separate CFS applications as if, as if their data were shared in the same software bus. We just uh, kind of trick the, the system to and we get the, CM, the SVN data and we just read that in our uh, SVN plugin and we just we do that to convert that information to ROS2. And here is a similar example to the ones I shown you before. A uh, ground side on the left, a flight side to the right. On the right side, you can see, sorry, it's a bit hard to see. Uh, I'm not going to go bigger because I think that freaks out my system. But at the right side, you have, uh, that is a Husky robot. That's from ClearPath Robotics. Uh, it's open source, so you can play with that uh, anytime you want. So this robot already comes with the ROS2 uh, uh, interface. So here, what we are doing is similar to before. Uh, we use the ground side to send commands and to get telemetry back. And the flight side, you have CFS running, and CFS is using the second bridge to get information back and forth from, from this little rover. Okay, let me go to the next one. And okay, just to wrap up a few of the things we have been working on during this last year. Uh, 
So when you start thinking about on the flight side of using a robot that maybe is using ROS2 and a robot that may not be in the same, you know, it can be it could be in a different computer than the computer that runs CFS, or it can be in the same computer but in a different processor. You have to start thinking about, for instance, how to send log information back to the ground. Uh, we did some work on that. Uh, we created a CFS app called ROS app that allows the user to you know, get the login data back to the ground. The user can select if you want the login data. Maybe you don't want it, maybe it's not critical. Maybe you can choose to get only error or critical information. So it gives a bit of a lot of flexibility for the user to get more uh, data. Uh, also, uh, again, when you have, when you think about using maybe a robot and CFS on different machines, you have to deal with time synchronization. This is pretty recent work uh, that our wonderful collaborator from APA recently uh, finished. So they have created this app called CFE SNTP. And what this app does, an overly simplified exp explanation is it runs an SNTP server inside the app. So if you have a robot and you want to synchronize your time with CFE, you just send a regular NTP uh, client request and you can get the time back and then your robot and you know, your CFE system are synchronized. So uh, if you want more details, uh, we can talk about that later, but here is uh, a picture of the repo. Uh, I talk about uh, file transfer back and forth. Uh, this is the same video I showed earlier. Uh, again, we use CFTP for this. I, I guess most of you guys are familiar with that. We use a CFS, the CF application to do a transfer. And we, we, again, we added some magic on top of it to make it a bit more easy to use from a ROS2 side uh, perspective. And finally, uh, I mentioned uh, how to use tools beside ROS2 uh, to visualize telemetry data and so on. So we also develop an OpenMCT plugin. Uh, here below, you can see the repo. And uh, this plugin, again, allows you to see data from the robot. Again, uh, the data can be anything. You literally just plug any robot as long as it has a ROS2 message. You can see the data there. No, you don't have to create anything. So I don't know. I think that's pretty cool. OK, uh, tutorials and documentation. Uh, we are open source. Uh, all this code became open source a couple of months ago. Uh, here is the, uh, the, the website. It's uh, online. We have done a lot of work uh, adding a lot of uh, tutorials for this. So everything that I have shown you today, you can, after this workshop, uh, you have instructions here on how to run that. Uh, mo mostly we run those on a Linux machine. If you don't have one, don't worry about that. We, we develop most of these on Docker containers. We have uh, Docker images available with the software already there. So you can just you know, download them and just play with it. Hopefully the information is complete. If not, here there is some information on whom you can contact for information. And it's still work in progress. I got a bug report yesterday night, so, which I'll, I'll resolve after uh, this workshop. But uh, we would love uh, for people to try this out and to give us some feedback uh, as needed. And I think, I think that's all I have for today. Uh, thank you very much. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to reply to them. Thank you. All right, thank you, Anna. A uh, few questions, one online question. Which DDS implementation are you using? Uh, for the ROS2 side of things, to be honest, I don't remember top of my head. I'm using whatever is the default. I, I want to say fast RTPS, but I may be wrong on that. I would have to get back on that. I'm using whatever is the default for the ROS2 side. OK. And um, I guess the follow-up, it seems you're downlinking the ROS2 messages without using ROS bags. Is that correct? Uh, that's correct. Uh, I didn't talk about this here. Uh, some of our experiments also are about uh, recording ROS bags on the flight side and eventually use CFDP to get the data back to the ground. Uh, I, mean, I haven't shown that, but that's also possible. We could use CFDP 
we we have actually done that before, but we can use CFTP for that. But for those examples, we haven't we haven't used any uh, bugs. Okay, next question. Hello, thank you for the presentation. Um, I wanted to ask if you considered also using uh, space ROS. <laughs> That's an yes, excellent but, uh, question, and I I had to take that slide out because of lack of time. So uh, the examples that in which that I show, let me, I can go all the way back, but the demonstration that I use, all of them use a space ROS, and mainly because the simulation for the robots. Uh, let me, okay, here. So this is a space ROS. This is running or running a space ROS. Uh, as we know, the purpose of a space ROS is to make a space ROS a, a flight software on itself, right? At the best of my knowledge, at this point in time, uh, that is still in a process in the a process that is still ongoing. So the this project started, I think, three years ago. Uh, I came into the project a year, uh, a few months ago. So when the project started, a space ROS was still kind of in an early development phase. So our goal was not to consider Space ROS or ROS2 as the flight software itself. It was mostly about communication. But for sure, I think uh, once Space ROS comes up to speed, uh, you know, there, there are uses for, for it too. Thank you. Um, another question. You mentioned using SBN to communicate both software. Which version of the SBN application do you guys use? Uh, I want to say the latest, but <laughs> to be honest, I mean, I'm not a CFS expert, but to the best of my knowledge, we are just getting whatever is on GitHub, the latest version. But I have to get, you know, to check with, with uh, our experts at APL, but I think I, I would say the latest, but I'm, I have to confirm. Okay, so we have time for one more question. I'm going to read it to you, and then afterwards, there's there's a few more questions for you, if you can follow up with them on Slack, Anna. So the last question, sure. is the bridge effectively making each node of CFS, uh, for example, control into a ROS node, callbacks, logic, et cetera, without having to code the node? So I, I guess I can go more into detail, but no, you don't have to create a ROS2 node, especially for, for this. So the bridge is already a ROS2 node, so you just have to, if you have new ROS2 messages, you have to do a bit of configuration, like editing a YAML file, telling, okay, this file, uh, this message we need to convert. And you have to use user to do the conversion, but that's only a one-time thing that you do before running stuff. But after that, you don't have to do a ROS2, uh, you don't have to convert ROS2 node. That, I think that, that, uh, that approach has been done by some other uh, fellow uh, developers of breaches, not not ours, but I, I think I've heard about that sort of approach, but that's not how we are doing it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, thanks everybody. <laughs>